Hello everyone, this is Paul the Okanite. Welcome to the channel. This time I will lead us through a demonstration of how to play Spruance Leader published by Dan Verson Games. I will not be playing to completion, but will give you a good idea how play proceeds along with my own commentary here and there throughout. Spruance Leader is part of the Leader system, spearheaded by the many Leader games in the system. It is a solitaire game where you, controlling ships and aircraft belonging to various good guy countries, fighting against the evil Soviets and their evil empire. Accordingly, most of the included campaigns are a piece of the effort to fight World War III. One exception, there is one campaign recreating the air naval portions of the Falklands War between the United Kingdom and Argentina. Rather than yammer on talking about the game, let's get started playing and I'll chime in from time to time with my opinions and will offer a summary at the end of the video. So, let's take a trip back to 1988 where the Soviet Union has taken the offensive by attempting to seize the Japanese home island of Hokkaido. Note that I will use version 2B of the rules provided by the game's designer, Dean Brown, in the file section of Board Game Geek. I will also use version 2 of the scenario card Dean has also made available on BGG. I'll have some thoughts on the updates, which are substantial, at the end of the video. The Invasion of Hokkaido, Cold War era scenario, pits the United States Navy against the attacking Soviets. For fun, though, Let's throw a curveball into the mix. Digging through the Allies expansion to the core game, I find four Japanese ships, so I am requiring that our task force use all of them before any U.S. ship may be selected. In addition, the U.S. Navy is pretty busy right now, so no USN vessels larger than destroyer are available. It's a big world and a big war. We begin the game by selecting a campaign, which as I said, I've already done. We're doing the Invasion of Hokkaido. And this is the version that I printed from Board Game Geek that has updates in it. And I'm setting up the campaign as if it were going to be a medium campaign with up to seven targets. Okay, to score the victory points that'll get you on the scale here as far as how well you did. Campaigns consist of playing through missions. And each mission has exactly one target card associated with it, and which you need to destroy what it says on the target card. And there can be more than one thing you need to destroy. And so I'm not implying that there's only one thing that you need to blow up. But, you know, there might be a collection of ships, and in some cases even land targets, in order to win that particular mission. And that is the primary way you score victory points in the game. And at the end of your, say, seven missions, you total up your victory points and you get on the scale here as far as how well you did. Each mission can also have random encounters in it that are determined by their placement, where you need to go to fulfill your mission, and uh, how many potentially are there. The better you do in the campaign, these markers will slide over to the right and reduce the number of potential random encounters that you uh, get involved with. So to keep things straight, just remember that your campaign consists of missions, and each mission has one target and a number of possible random encounters that uh, can appear during the mission. And you do the number of missions that it says for your campaign, and you've just completed the campaign. We begin with task force setup. And to set up the task force, the first thing we need to do is do priority R&R. Now, since it's the first uh, turn of the game, we haven't done any missions yet. We have no stress to, to relieve, so there's no reason to do uh, any R&R. You have to pay 10 SO points to do it. And uh, typically, I don't do that. Typically, I prefer to buy another ship. They say the 10 SO points can actually buy you a decent frigate, although Anything that comes in after the game is already underway comes in as a newbie, but it's my personal preference. I'd rather have another newbie frigate, take one of the uh, ships that has been in previous missions that's gotten fatigued and set it aside, put it in, keep it in port for the next mission, let it rest, bring in a newbie who will work his way up the chain, hopefully. All right, so we do nothing here. Target selection, now that's, there's, we have, you know, what targets? We haven't done anything yet. Well, what that means is we pick a target card. And this is our target. Now, you can 
you get to pick possibly more than one card. Uh, you have to look at the target number, which is 12. And then you have to look at your campaign sheet. Can, here's number 12. So we know we're going to have to only go in two zones. That's good to know. Target 12 is black instead of red. That means we can actually pick another card if we want to. If you pick a red target, that's your target. You have to do it. If you pick a black target, you actually can pick a second card or even potentially pay some SO points and pick a third one. I've never done that. I always find what I, what I need in the, the first or second card. We're going to take on an enemy anti-submarine force consisting of two Udloys and what is this? A Savormanimanimanimini, okay, and one unknown sub, okay. And to win this, we have to destroy all surface ships, which means the submarine is not a surface ship. We don't have to destroy that to win this one. If we do win this one, we get five victory points, and we get to shift the task force marker over by one. Honest, this AO, I think that is going to be in the extended campaign. I don't see any reference to it in the core game. I think that's going to be in the fourth module that comes out. All right, so this is what we got to take on. And I'm going to accept this one. Our target, therefore, is number 12. The mission location is there, OK? We are here. We have picked a target. So our, our starting number of SO points are 120 per the scenario. Right there, OK? Uh, next, purchase task force equipment followed by assemble your task force. So basically, you're buying your ships and stuff, not, not munitions, but other things you may want to put on them. And so, uh, as I said in my scenario rule, the Japanese ships are obligatory, so I've paid for those. Uh, in addition, I have bought a spruance along with a helicopter put, to put on the spruance, because none of the Japanese ships can take helicopters. None of them have towed or raid sonar either, which is kind of a bummer. Uh, in addition, I've taken the Reuben James, a, uh, a spare frigate, and because in this scenario, once we go above having two, four, five, six, the seventh and beyond thing that we take comes in as average. That's what the asterisk here is, okay? So, I have got, uh, uh, let's see, counting the two leaders, uh, the two admirals that can run the task force, basically. Uh, I put the guy running the task force in as skilled. Uh, I have a reserve commander who is uh, a newbie, so I use one of my newbies on him. Uh, I have, I think I have two extras, so I think I have three averages, two greens, and two newbies. So I got one newbie ship, and there's one really bad Japanese ship. It was built in the 70s. It can't even carry missiles or anything. It doesn't have any NAR care, uh, capability, and the only thing you can do is shoot at uh, ships with a gun, which means it's not going to last very long. But it's a scenario rule I put out there, and I'm just going to live with it. Now, one of the things that I also have to live with, without having anything heavier than in a U.S. destroyer, that means I do not have a Ticonderoga missile cruiser, which means I do not benefit from its umbrella, its protective missile umbrella, that it can go ahead and project over every ship in the task force if it's in the task force screen. So each of these ships is going to stand or fall on its own defensive capabilities without help from a Ticonderoga. Usually I don't do this. Usually I take like four ships. I, ha I have a Ticonderoga that I load up. I take a, a Spruance, which I load up. And then a couple rum dum uh, uh, frigates. And uh, I, I usually go in with four ships on the first mission. All right. But because I have four Japanese ships of varying quality from okay all the way down to horrible, I decided to get a fifth ship. I got a Spruance, the USS Fletcher, and that is going to be probably the lead ship, although I'm making the best of the Japanese ships, is the flagship. I'm assuming we have a Japanese admiral on board or some such thing. I decided just to do that. I also bought a spare frigate, and since I bought it up front rather than waiting for during the game, which I usually do, but this time I'm not. I brought it in now, so it's going to come in as average. A lot of scenarios I saw have the extra guys come in as green. Coming in as average is too good to ignore. And this guy has a towed array, like the Fletcher. The Japanese don't have a towed array sonar, so I thought I, I better have another one. 
And probably in the second mission, if we do that, I would swap out probably one of the Japanese ships and bring in this guy to start leveling the stress out more over the units. Now, one of the things that you do pay for at this time, in addition to buying the ships, is that you buy the equipment. One of the Japanese ships, I'm giving this. It cost me four SO points, and it makes them a more effective uh, against SSNs and SSGNs. Plus two on his die, attack die rolls versus those guys. So that's a really good thing. And the other thing I did is uh, bought a plus one cool marker uh, for the Fletcher. So that means that he's going to automatically recover one stress point at the end of encounters. That means he's going to be harder to pile stress upon. He will have more staying power. And I got one helicopter that's on the Fletcher. All right. I'm assembling the task force. I'm bringing five ships. I've got the Reuben James sitting back in port along with my, my second uh, admiral who is a, uh, he's a newbie, so hopefully I never need to use him. Uh, I've got the Namak... Uh, Hadakazi? Yeah, what is this? Yeah, the Hadakazi and the Asagari in the lead. They're in the front of the screening force. In the main part of the uh, forest, I've got the Ubuki, the Shitozi, who is that really bad ship I mentioned, and I've got the Fletcher, who is absolutely the best ship in this group. Uh, the flagship is the Hatakazi, this guy here. The task force has been assembled. It's on the tactical display. The draw cup is set up. I have to put draw ships Draw tits in here. This is for when enemies are searching. The guys in the screen have three counters in the cup. The guys in the second row would have two. And if we had anything in the supported protected force, each one of those would only have one. So it's, the guys in front are, are taking a bit more risk than the guys in the main part of the task force. Purchasing ordnance. I've gone ahead and, and done that. The, the way I usually go about doing that is the, the, the scenario, in addition to telling you the number of SO points you get up front, it also tells you the number of mission SO points you get. So basically at the start of every mission, it gives you some free points. Uh, in this case, the number is 26. I get 26 points that I can use. I can spend them, I can bank them, I can do what I want. What I like to do is that starting cash of 120, I use that as kind of my capital budget. I, I use that to buy equipment that's going to go through the campaign with me. Uh, the, the mission SO points, the stuff that's given me for, for a mission, I, that's where I buy the ammo. Okay, that's my operating expense. So I've got a, I go, that's exactly what I did. I've spent 26 points on various weapons, and I tend to load the most of the weapons on the superior ship. So, for example, you see on the Fletcher, I've gone ahead and loaded the, uh, the RGM 109s, which are ship-to-ship -ship, uh, Tomahawk missiles. Those are the best missiles that the, uh, that the U.S. has for uh, anti-ship. The RGM 84s are the harpoon missiles. That's, the, uh, that's kind of the standard missile that's used. Shorter range, it only has a range of four, but typically speaking, that's going to be good enough to, uh, to do things with. And then the Mark 46 Azrocks, those are torpedoes that get shot out to two or three range uh, to attack submarines. These do, not, these do not attack surface vessels, only submarines. And then the RIM-7s are short range, very short range missiles, basically sparrows that uh, Sparrow missiles, like you would have on a fighter plane, uh, that, uh, that help defend the task force when it's, things are real tight and close, which the Japanese flagship has the Standard 1 missile, which is, according to the game, is a Vietnam-era missile that uh, can go out to a range of three on the tactical board. So it, it's it's... It's tough, because these Su-27s can shoot at you at range 4, and the longest we can shoot at back at them is range 3. So we better hope that they don't get any target locks and start uh, shooting us at range 4, it could, or it could be a very hard day for this task force. So I spent all 26 points, and I spread the, uh, 
the points around. I didn't put anything on that crappy Japanese ship, the uh, Shitozi, but it does have some radar and it does have some sonar. So it's there as a sensor platform uh, primarily. And most of it's on the Fletcher and the Japanese flagship. So hopefully they will be able to do the job. And that's kind of normal. I tend to put the most of the weapons on the best ships. Then we move on to filling out the log sheet, which I have done. And we can see kind of how that's done. You see uh, the, the ships listed in the task force, some of their statistics, some of their, their quality, well, how many points it takes to uh, promote to the next level. Cool ratings. So see, these are not all that experienced. I, the, bet, the most experienced ships I have are average, which is the Reuben James and the Fletcher. And then one helicopter, also on the Fletcher. Uh, from the 120, I added in the 26 that you get at the top of every mission. I had 71 left. SO points used, 26. SO points remaining, 44. And so the 44 will carry over until the next mission. And again, we'll still get an extra 26 points. Next, we need to set up the mission sheet. And the first thing is to place the task force counter, which is right there. It's placed in, its, uh, in the first position. Roll for enemy task force placements. So we can have up to four. And so I got to roll four dice and see where they are. And uh, depending on the die rolls, they will go in any of those four positions. I rolled a 10, a 9, a 2, and a 5. So, uh, looks like we're going to have one here, a 5, and a 9 and 10 are up here. So we're only going to have potentially one encounter with, the, uh, with a random force, although we still could hit the SUs up here. Shuffled X, done. And now, mission execution. First thing to do when you're executing the mission is to move the task force counter. So, the task force counter has been moved. Enemy air attack che uh, checks were not in the red zone, so there's no air attacks going on this time. Enemy task force activity check. All right, we do have a possible something. This would be a random encounter. So we pick from the engagement deck. We pick the top card. This is going to be submarines. This is for the advanced campaign, which we don't know exactly how that's going to work yet. But we're going to roll a die. Depending on the roll of the die, we could have nothing. We could have low intensity or high intensity. And we look at the activity level and see we have a plus three. That means we're going to add three to the die. So it's nice to get this pushed over by succeeding with missions so that subsequent encounters start getting easier. All right, we need to roll a die. Die roll is four, we add three. So according to the card, we have a, a basically a low intensity conflict that's gonna happen here. We flip the card. And we see for the low intensity, we have two unknown subs versus two named subs. So these are, these might not, st we still don't know for sure if they're actually going to be here. So what I'm going to do is going to pick two enemy subcards and we're going to see what's there. So what I'm going to do is to go into the enemy sub cup, or I don't know, I think this is a sushi thing, uh, and pick out two counters. We don't know what these subs are yet. If, they, if I don't get any that are starred, we can end the encounter. Well, first one is starred. That means we're stuck. We have to fight this out, at least until we destroy that guy. Second thing we do is pick, a sec pick the second one. Oh boy, it's another starred one. So we've got possibly, not for sure yet, but possibly some pretty stiff opposition in the guise of enemy submarines. So now I'm going to roll for the distance and azimuth of the first enemy sub. Azimuth. So I rolled a seven and a seven on the sub thingy is okay. Is at range five and then the other roll is a six, seven, six. So he's going to be here. All right. Well, you'll see in a second. The next one I roll. 
it is a one and a six. So a one means he's really close. He's range three and a six puts him right about in the middle. So we have one unknown sub that's kind of uncomfortably close. We have one that's out there at range five, manageable, but uh, that one that is close is kind of annoying. The guy who's farther away, at least in his undetected state, until we, we find out exactly what he is, he has a noise modifier too. So this could be a, a pretty quiet sub, all right? We do know they're going to have they're going to be starred if they are here at all. We now place the battle turn counter on five. Everything being equal, there are five battle rounds in each encounter potentially. And I skipped this, but let's go ahead and do it now. Uh, I like to use the option rule for sensor performance, so that means we pull a card and see that it's stormy. So, so there's a possibility that these submarines are deep. All subs are assumed to be SSNs, unless you know for sure otherwise. So the plus two does apply. Uh, for the guy who's close up, I roll 10. That means he's deep. He's deep. So he's going to be below the layer. And the second guy, a three goes to a five. And they are both deep submarines. And I have marked the uh, both submarines as being deep. Uh, we've set the turn card at five, and now we pick an event. And as with all these DVG games, event cards have, this is before the encounter, and this would be after the encounter. So we're only going to pay attention to this guy. Engine trouble. This screening vessel has some engine issues number two guy so that is this guy the asagari and proceed to the protected area so he's got engine trouble hey isn't that just wonderful i'm going to switch over to the sequence of play that's actually printed on the map while we're in uh, a tactical encounter and we will start with perform sonoboy detection checks well there's no sonoboys out there so uh, we don't need to do anything Perform fast task force actions. Uh, just in other DVG leader games, some units are fast, some units are slow. The sequence of play is fast units go first, then the enemy goes, and then your slow units. You can voluntarily slow down a fast unit so it goes in the, the slow segment. So we lost one of our fast ships uh, because of engine trouble. But we still have the Hasakazi. The, uh, the Hakazaki, the Hake, whatever it is, we still got one. So as a fast action, he's going to uh, do a sonar check on this deep sub that's, that's at range three. So the Hatakazi is going to attempt to detect the Soviet sub, possible contact at range three. We see that he's going to use his passive sonar. Uh, so we're going to have the Atakazi go ahead and try to detect this unknown enemy sub. We first look at the sensor performance card, and we see we're at, we're at range 3, and we this is a, a ship without a towed array, so uh, against a deep sub. So we're going to have to use the shallow number. As In addition, we're going to have to try to uh, go through the layer, so the layer modifier will apply as well. That's going to be a detriment of 2 in total, a 0 minus 2. And then the... Uh, Noise modifier for the unknown sub is zero, so that remains at uh, a minus two. Now, uh, on the plus side, we have a ship that's in the screen, so the Hatakazi is in the screen, and so that gets him one back. Uh, it's going to be a detriment of one net. So we have a net modifier of minus one. Let's go ahead and roll it. A one. Lousy roll. So a one minus one is going to be a zero. We needed, uh, we needed to at least get up to a six. So we needed at least a seven to pull this off with the Hatakazi and well, he just didn't do it. And the Hatakazi is done. Now, our leader has the ability to do one fast and one slow action. So if we look here, 
we see that he has one fast and one slow. So he could use his fast action now. And among his actions include a ship action, which will allow a ship to do something. So we could make really any ship we want do something with a command action from the Admiral. Um, maybe that's a good thing to do. I don't like how close that guy is. If we want to try to get him in the fast phase, I think the best thing may be to have the Fletcher come in with its towed array. It does have a towed array and uh, he may do something. All right, let's do that. So the Admiral used his fast action. He's going to use it to activate the Fletcher. Surprise me again. And the Fletcher is going to try to detect this sub. Uh, the Fletcher, it's going to... Now, he is not in the screen. He is in the main part of the task force, so he does not get that, that minus one or that plus one benefit. But at the same time, he, with a toad array, he, does, he can ignore the minus two for the layer. So he's coming in at a zero, no modifier, for the toad array ignores the layer. So no modifier, and he has no modifier for anything else. So this is a straight up roll. And for him, he's a four slash six. So we need at least a four. We need at least a four to do to get a detection. We got a four. All right. So we got detection level one. Now that we have detected this submarine, a few things happen. Uh, first thing is that we flip it over and there's a table and we roll on the table and so on a one it's a neutral sub two through six it's an enemy sub or seven or more it's nothing so let's see what we got four all right we actually have an enemy sub now the way I'm playing this and the rules are not exactly clear but I can't imagine any other way you do it is that there are the cards in the in the enemy subcard pile uh, have submarines that have stars and don't have stars. And so since we know this guy is a starred vessel, I'm just going to toss anything that doesn't have a star. Well, the first one we pick has a star. All right. So we have us and we have an alpha. Oh, joyful, an alpha. That's what I want to see. So we know we have an actual Soviet sub. It's detected at range three. It's also deep. We have detection level one, which is the minimum. If we had gotten detection level two, we actually would have been allowed to fire one weapon at him and potentially do something. But that's not the deal we got. Uh, the alpha, uh, I put his card over here. I tagged it as enemy sub number one. Yes, he, if, he, if he advances, he will be within range to fire, but he still has to detect something to do that. Uh, we've used all of our fast actions that we have, so fast actions are now done. Move enemy units. All right, that's rolling on a table. There is a movement modifier on the card. In this case, it says movement plus two, so it's plus two. Plus two to the die roll, all right? Up here is the enemy movement. There's a, uh, a sub column and a surface column, so on the sub column, we're going to roll. I rolled a ten. So that means, and, and he's going to, so he's going to be range minus two. So he is in our face. He dashed forward. This is bad. If he detects something. He, he rushed forward. And, uh, but he's also pinging. In the core game, all that does is make him noisy. It doesn't help him find anything because there are no, there are no friendly subs here. All right. And then I'm going to roll for the other guy who, since we don't have a, any kind of uh, information on him, it's just going to be a straight up roll. A one. A one and for a sub is patrol and snorkel if it's a, a snorkel if it is a battery powered this one is a nuclear sub so we ignore that so patrol means he does nothing he just sits there okay but this guy is cruising for a bruising and the bruising he wants to cruise for is us all right next on the card 
there is a contact rating. Contact rating. That means that he can track one target. Some guys can track more than one target. So this guy, he is, uh, he only tracks one target. Actually, he's, once, once we get a hold of him, he's noise modifiers here. So this, alphas are fairly noisy, uh, but they can evade torpedoes fairly well. So but now he's doing the searching. He can search for one target. So what we do, pull one counter out of our cup here that we have weighted towards the front. Now that we got, actually I got to make an adjustment here because we had the, two, the guy in slot two go away and he moved into slot seven. So let me adjust the cup for that. All right, let's roll, let's randomize and do it. Who is the lucky one? It is task force ship number four. And ship number four is the Chitozi. So uh, he is trying to detect it, and so we have to make our roll. So this Alpha submarine is trying to detect the crappiest submarine in the, uh, the task force, but still it is a ship. Uh, he's fairly handy at f uh, finding surface vessels. He's got a 4 slash 8 rating. And so uh, only a 1, 2, or 3 un unmodified would result in no detection. But what are the modifiers? Well, if once we look at the sensor performance, we see that uh, this is a deep submarine, so the layer does come into play. We see that at range 1, there's no modifier here. The sea is churned up. It's a stormy. It's a stormy day, and we don't. We're not getting any benefit really for this close range. There's, there's a, a lot of noise that's going on in the water. In addition, the chateaus, chateaus, chateauzy, whatever, has got a uh, noise modifier of zero. Okay, so there's no modifier there either. So it is going to have because of going through the layer. It is going to have a minus two uh, to the die. So let's see what he rolls. I rolled a nine, goes to a seven, and a seven becomes a detection level one. Okay, he needed at least an eight to get detection level two. If he had gotten detection level two, he could actually take a shot. So the result of this is that he was successful in getting a weak fix on the Chateauzi. And so this task force counter stays with him while he has this detection. He only has a contact rating of one, so this is the only guy he's gonna be able to track. Uh, it's at detection level one because it was only a one, not at least a two with this. He's not able to shoot until next turn. And I mark him with a yellow disc to show that he is now done. We have one more submarine out here. He didn't move, but let me see if he can see anything or at least attempt to see something. We got. This guy lurking way out here at range five. Because this guy is a, an undetected sub, we're not even sure he exists. If he detects something, then we, we have to reveal it. When we look out at range five, he's a deep sub. So he's gonna have the minus two for the layer and an additional minus two for range. So he's gonna have a minus four. And depending on who he picks on, if it's a quiet ship, uh, there could be more than that. So let's see who he's going to try to detect. Number three. Ship three. Okay. So, ship three is the Ubari. And he's going to be rolling a minus four on the die roll. And the Ubari is not particularly quiet. It has a zero noise modifier zero noise modifier so it's just going to be a straight up uh, no modifier for that but it's going to be minus four for the environment so let's roll and this guy is the, the it's right printed right on the counter it says six slash nine with a minus four attached we roll a three minus four is a negative number he does not detect anything when he don't detect anything the task force ship uh, counter goes back in the cup there was no effect there. All right, so all the bad guys have moved. They've done their detections. They didn't have any shots yet. Now the task force slow gets to do slow actions. All right, unfortunately, the guy that 
We loaded up with the sub-killing skill. It's the same guy that had the engine trouble, so he's not going to do any good for us right now. Uh, but we haven't used the helicopter yet, and I particularly like launching helicopters when there's unescorted subs around. There's no surface ships to take pot shots at these guys. So I think as my first slow action, we're going to try to uh, we're going to try to kill us a sub. Okay, I want to kill this thing. So we're going to launch this helicopter. It is, it's a Sea King flown by Cleaner. So I've got to find the Cleaner counter, and we're going to put him on the board. He, is, uh, he has one Sona Boy, and he's got two Marks 46 torpedoes. He also, though, has Dipping Sonar, which is very nice. I have found Cleaner's counter, and I'm going to first act. First thing he's going to do, he gets four... Basically movement points, if you want to call it that, or action points in his turn. But whenever he takes off or lands, he collects one stress point. So he has a stress level of one, and he's not affected until he gets seven. So he's doing just fine. Thank you very much. So the first thing that uh, Cleaner is going to do is simply to take off. That costs one of his four points. He's going to move out. With the sub, that costs him one more point. He has two left. Since this guy is detected, he could drop one or both of his torpedoes on him. Now, he only has two for this mission, so he'll be kind of done for launching torpedoes. But we know that this is probably the only random mission we're going to face. And we also know that there's only one sub in the target, and we don't have to kill it to win. So maybe we can go ahead and drop, or if we... You get a higher detection level. Detection levels give die roll modifiers. And let's take a look at the card one more time. And we see that uh, for his dipping sonar, 4 slash 7 slash 9, which means he has a chance to, as on a 4, 5, or 6, that'd be a level 1 detect. 7, 8, it'd be level 2. And a 9 and a 10 would be level 3. So he has a chance to get a level 3 detection. And he's also got a plus one modifier for his personal skill. So we have, let's see, we have a fair chance with a dipping sonar. And this is uh, the noise modifier on the submarine is zero, so it's a noisy kind of sub. Uh, if we got a six or more, we could improve this detection from detection one to two or possibly three. Or we could just dump torpedoes on them and hope. So let's think about this for a second. If were we to just dump torpedoes on him, we have the helicopter is got, or the pilot has a skill level of one. Uh, the ship, his uh, torpedo defense is two, so that's gonna take it to a one detriment. And his detection level is one. He's detected level one, that's gonna get that one point back again. And then whenever you launch more than one weapon, you get a volley slash spread modifier. If you launch, the first weapon you launch is just whatever it is. The second one gets a one, uh, a one point advantage. And the third and the fourth one get two. You can only fire three or four if you have vertical launch capability, but uh, he does have two and he can use two. So we've been going for just a base roll, which on the weapon, it's, it's a seven. So we'd have a seven to 10 on, on one roll and a six to 10 on a second roll. So it's Far from for sure, but it's better than 50-50 to get a hit on him. And this submarine takes two hits to kill. So I think I'm going to drop torpedoes and hope. So the helicopter drops two Mark 46s on top of this sub. The base to hit is a 7. All right, so it's a base roll, and the second one is going to be a plus one. So shooting for a 7 or more on the first torpedo. 10, one hit. And shooting for a six or more on the second torpedo. Three. Okay, so we got a hit. So how does that work? Well, this submarine, this submarine takes two hits to kill. All right, so we took out a chunk, but he's not dead yet. So this sub is assigned an enemy damage counter one, which Make some noisier, uh, minus one on torpedo defense, minus one missile defense, minus two on when he attacks. So he's overall less effective than he was before he was damaged. 
Oh, by the way, I forgot that the guy's pinging. That would have been another minus three on a detection attempt. So it would have been an 80% chance of getting this detection improved. Oh, well, next time. Uh, so we have, we have three ships that still can go, and we have a slow action that we haven't used yet. These torpedoes are done, and they're done for the, uh, the, the mission. They don't come back. Yes, you can use up your ammunition if you're not careful. And my next action is going to be uh, to use the, the Admiral's slow action to actually do a, a move, a task force, a uh, move task force. Once per turn, you can do this, and I'm going to do it now. And what it is, is it moves all these guys back. It moves everybody back. Everything's back one. And the reason why I'm doing this is that my Mark 40, my, or excuse me, my Azrock torpedoes, my Azrock torpedoes, uh, I can't shoot at range one. So we kind of have a blind spot, if you want to think of it that way. All right. Now we can unload on the guy. Um, the Fletcher was uh, activated last uh, earlier with a Admiral's action, so he has not used his action yet. He has not used his action yet. And what else do I have? This guy's pinging, he's damaged, and he is a, not a particularly quiet sub, so maybe, maybe the Shatozi, which is not armed with anything that can hurt this guy, can just try a detection. Maybe he's going to turn on his active sonar. All right. So with active sonar, it's good out to range two. Uh, this guy is below the lair. Uh, we still have to deal with that. That's going to be a two detriment uh, with according to the sensor performance and zero there. So it's going to be a two detriment. Uh, however, since he's a, he is a newbie, he has an, his own minus two. So now we're at minus four. This is starting to get serious, but what do we got going for us? And he can't do anything else, so it doesn't cost us anything. So he, his noise level is now a plus one because of the damage. And he's pinging, so it's plus four. It's a wash. It's a wash. Okay. So the Shatozi is, is pinging away. And we're going to go after this submarine. A nine. We got detection level two. Unfortunately, this ship does not have any, it does not have any weapons that can fire. So otherwise, because we would have gotten to shoot something, but we can't do that because this ship doesn't have anything it can shoot. But we did improve the detection to detection two, and that's good enough for me. Uh, let's see, we got the Ubari, and I got the Fletcher. So I'm going to go with the Ubari uh, making an attack. The Ubari has two Bofors Azrock torpedoes. They're good at range two and three. So calculating Ubari's shot, uh, his skill modifier is zero. It says right on the card, sub, sub is plus zero. Uh, range azimuth, it's not going to have any effect here. Uh, it's going to be zero. Or actually, no, I take that back. Range, 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 range. Plus one. Range does have effect for shooting because environmental effects do not affect shots. They only affect spotting. All right, so it is it's going to be plus one for, for range. It's minus two for the ship's torpedo defense, but it loses one for the damage, so it's going to be even up. Uh, detection level is two, so it's going to be plus two, and he's firing two weapons. The first one is going to be at plus two. The second one is going to be at plus three for volley fire. So we got two Bofors. Plus two, that means that if uh, a five or better hits. Eight. All right, so that's the second hit on this guy. He's destroyed. The second one, just for fun. Oh, the second one missed. So it all works out. This uh, first target is destroyed. So with the sinking of the Alpha, all of the markers get put away. And the only thing left now is the helicopter that went over to... Uh, take shots, they actually delivered one hit. And uh, the Ubari sank this. When you sink a starred vessel, 
you get a, you're going to get an experience point at the end of the encounter. So the Ibari is going to pick up an extra experience point. That's the only way you get experience uh, in a random encounter is if you sink a starred vessel. Uh, so I think there were some mistakes in some videos where they were giving, uh, they were giving experience points for no normally like you would in a target, in it with a target, and uh, that you only get those extra points in the targeted encounters. You do not get them in the random encounters. The only experience you can get in a random encounter under normal circumstances is for sinking a starred vessel. All right, so the Ubari did that. And now the Ubari's turn is done. Last to go is the Fletcher. And there's really nothing to do except for a detection attempt. The good news is that the Fletcher has towed array. So let me uh, uh, calculate this out. Okay, it's going to be massive because we see for the toad array at maximum range is minus seven. Uh, and this guy has a two noise modifier. It says so right on the counter. Two noise modifier. So that's a minus nine. I don't think I'm going to even worry about that. So this is going to be a, uh, there's no way he can detect him. So what he's going to have to do is, and I was hoping to do this, uh, this turn is to get guy, force them to come closer Unfortunately, I had to push him away to take the shots at that close sub that charged me. So that was unfortunate, but it's what had to happen. And this other guy's a starred sub, so we cannot break off. We have to keep going. All right. So there's nothing we can do. The uh, Fletcher has nothing to do. Uh, so we're going to say that's the end of this round. At the end of the round, you decrease detection levels. Nobody's detected. You decrease them by one, so uh, detections gradually fade away. End encounter decision. There's no decision to make. It's a starred vessel. I have to stick. If I were to break off, then I would lose the mission. Okay, so, yeah, you can break off, but the mission is over. Not only the encounter is over, but the mission is over as well. So, we're not doing that. And repeat the engagement step. So, we tick it down to four left, and we go to the top, which is perform Sonoboy detections. So we're now starting the second battle turn. We have one possible Soviet sub out at maximum range. We have a helicopter in the air and we have our rest of our ships ready to go. Uh, the Chitose will be pinging until his next move. So he'll be noisy until he gets to do something in the slow uh, action phase of the turn. All right, we begin with uh, Sona Boys. There's none of those out there. We perform fast actions. And since this submarine is so far away from us, we're going to uh, convert all our fast actions to slow actions. Let's see what this sub is going to do. So we are on to move enemy units. And the first thing we do there is roll for moving this sub. We have our table over here and... No die roll modifiers, so straight off the table. I roll an 8 for a submarine that is flank or range minus 1. He cannot go to the flank because there is no flank at this range, so he has to go range minus 1. A flank is he would move to the side. There's attack bonuses for submarines coming in from the side, and uh, so they try to qualify for that when they can. In this case, since he has no flank he can move to, he's going to close the range by one, which is exactly what we want him to do. Now that he has had his move, he's going to attempt to detect one of our ships. He has one that he can go after. He's not detected yet, so he, uh, he only gets one attempt. He's going after ship number four, which is our pinger. Oh, boy. Okay, so he's going to try to detect the Chitose. Well, in this case, we look at the sensor performance card. He's a deep sub. He is at range 5, so that's going to be a minus 2 for the state of the water, the sea state. It's rough out there today. And he has to go through the layer, so that's an additional minus 2. So we start at minus 4. However, uh, the Chitose is pinging. That, that swings it 3 back the other way. And let's see, he has no modifier for noise. Okay, so he's, you know, he's, he's a newbie, so he doesn't know how to be quiet yet. So right now the uh, die modifiers are minus one to the die roll. 
And we see printed on the enemy subcounter, the contact is 6 slash 9. So he gets a level 1 with a 6, 7 or 8, a level 2 with a 9 or 0. But we are subtracting 1 off the die roll. And we roll. Roll to 1. 1 falls off the bottom of the table. He does not detect his attempted target. All right, so he is done. We're on to the slow task force action. So what's going on now is exactly what we wanted to have happen. We are going to uh, go ahead and pull him in. We're going to pull him in by using a commander action. It doesn't matter. We have two of them. You can only reposition them one time in the turn, but we're going to do it now. It doesn't matter. They're both basically slow actions at this point. So we use one. And so now our task force is basically steaming towards the contact, everything moves in. So the helicopter moves in and the submarine moves in. These Azrock torpedoes only reach out to range three, so we got to get them closer if we're going to be able to do anything to him. We're going to begin by activating the helicopter, and he has four activity points, for lack of a better word. He's got to close the distance on this sub. All movement for helicopters is orthogonal, no diagonal movement allowed. You can go three and maybe drop a Sono Boy, or you could go right on top of the enemy sub. Normally, if he goes on top of an enemy sub, if that sub is uh, not deep, he would get to do a magnetic anomaly detection. But since the sub is deep, he won't get to do that. So he could go three, maybe drop a Sono Boy, or move four. I think we're just going to move four. So it's one two, three, four, and now the uh, helicopter is done. All right, next, I think we're going to have the Hatakazi. I think we're going to have the Hatakazi activate and attempt an, a detection. Since he is the, in the screen, he gets a, a, a one-point modifier in his favor. To make this detection attempt, the Hatakasi first looks at its skill modifier. It is plus zero because it's an average ship, and that's just what it is, plus zero for uh, submarines. The range is on the card, and we see it is going to be a plus two. It's actually easier with this sensor performance card to detect things at range four than it is one, two, or three. Water does strange things, uh, including bending sound waves and making them do all kind of odd uh, things, and this is one of those, uh, the, one of those times. The range modifier for the environment is plus two, but since he does not have a toad array, he's having to use the minus two. So that nets out to zero. If he did have a toad array, he would not use the layer. He would ignore the shallow number and he would just use the minus three. So this is a case where it's actually better for him to be using regular sonar and not use a toad array. This is gonna net out to zero. Enemy sub noise modifier is two, so that's two in the sub's favor. That's printed right on the counter. He's undetected, so it stays at a two. It is a screening ship attempting, so we get one back, so it's a, a one detriment. They're undamaged, and that's it. So it's a one detriment die roll, and the Hatakazi is a six slash eight, and it's going to be minus one off the die. I rolled a one. It fails. So the, the detection uh, attempt fails and the Hatakazi is done. Next, I'm going to activate the Chitosi, Chitos, whatever, since basically he has no weapons and he's the crappiest ship out here. When he has his move here, he gets to remove the ping marker, unless I decide to put it out there, but pings are only good out to range two. We remove the ping counter. All right, looking at our table of mods again, still at range four, so the sonar performance nets out to zero still. The enemy ship still has its noise modifier of two in his favor. And this is not in the screen, so it's gonna be a two detriment at the base numbers of seven slash nine. So I rolled a five, subtract two, that's a three, no contact, and the Chitos is done. And actually, I neglected to include the sub modifier minus two on that. So uh, it was going to be even worse. So he, did, he didn't see nothing. The Ubari 
He successfully sank the first Soviet sub. His skill modifier is plus zero, and his base is seven slash nine. It's going to come down to the noise modifier of the sub, minus two. The environment's a wash, so it's just going to be a straight up minus two roll with a seven slash nine base. Six, no contact. So now we're going to activate the Fletcher. The Fletcher has a skill modifier of plus one for the sub detection. The environment would net out to zero if you use standard sonar. If you use a tow array, it's going to be a minus three. So I'm assuming it's his option whether to use the towed array or not. So he's going to use his standard passive sonar. That's going to net out to zero. The enemy ship's noise modifier is still two, so now it's going to be one point in the sub's favor. The Fletcher is not in the screen, so that's not an issue. There's no damage. There's no detection. So it's going to be one point in the sub's favor on the roll. The base, however, is much better. He's got better sonar. It's a 4-6. So 4-6, minus one on the roll. Two, and another no contact. At this point, the last option we have is to use the second action from our task force commander. Uh, I see two possibilities. One, he could, uh, he could activate a ship to do another search. Or alternatively, he could uh, take the Asagari out of the protected slash support area and put him back up in the screen. We'll inflict one stress on the Asagari, which is not horrendous. He takes six before he goes shaken. He will get some stress at the end of this encounter. But we also know that this is a pretty short-range mission, and it should not matter that much. I'm thinking, since this guy really has some good kill rolls, he's got the plus two. He's got this assigned to him. So basically, this represents captain skill and crew skill. Uh, they, they've, they've concentrated... Uh, training and killing subs. Well, that's kind of a good thing in this situation. Okay, rather than uh, make another die roll for searching, I am going to use that action to move the Asagari back up to the front. And the Asagari will be assigned one point of stress for doing this. And that is all of the actions that we have. Note that when you do it with a slow action, the, uh, this movement has to be the last thing you do. So you can't do it at the beginning of the slow segment and then have the, the Asagari act. However, if you did it with a fast action, you could do it at the very beginning of the fast phase, and I think then he would be able to do something. But that's not what we did. Decrease detection levels by one. There are no detection uh, levels will gradually de diminish. There is a detect zero. So a detect one would go down to a detect zero, and then a detector would disappear. But there's no detections out there, so that's nothing. And decrease the battle turn. We have three battle turns left. The decision to end the encounter. Now, yes, I could decide to end the encounter. However, because this is a starred opponent, even though it is a random encounter, I would lose the mission, not just the engagement, but I would lose the mission, which I don't want to do. So we'll keep on going and repeat the engagement steps. So we're back up to the top and let me clean it up. So we have finished two segments and we have three left. As always, we begin the segment with uh, Sonoboy detection attempts. Well, there are no Sonoboys, so we skip over that. And we're on to the Fast Task Force actions. Well, I'd be tempted to have the helicopter take an action with a uh, task force commander fast action. But since the, the guy is at range four, uh, we have no weapons in range of him. So even if I found him, I couldn't do anything to him before he got a chance to act. So I think rather than do that, I'm going to have uh, not the Asagari because he is the killer. He's the guy who can uh, try to kill him. If the Hanakazi can find him, then I could bring him in closer within range of the Asagari's weapons. So I think maybe that would be a better thing to do. All right, so let's see if the Hatakazi can find him. And so many things have stayed the same. Basically, uh, at range four, the, uh, when you're going with standard sonar as opposed to a toad array, it's a wash. 
So it's a zero modifier. The Hadakazi has a zero skill, so there's nothing there. The submarine is noise mod of two, so that's two against us, but the Hadakazi is a screening vessel that gets us one back. So it's gonna be plus one, and the base is uh, six slash eight. So six slash eight minus one. Five goes to a four, and that is a no contact, and the Hadakazi is done. I think what I'm going to do at this point is go ahead and defer all my other fast actions to the slow phase and let this submarine do what it's going to do. At range four, even if he goes closer by one, I don't think he, most, most of the submarine torpedoes can only go two. Now, if this is an SSBN instead of an SSN, that could be, cause us a problem. But I'm going to take that risk and go ahead, let, let the submarine go ahead and, and do what it's going to do. So, let's see, there's no modifiers. We just roll on the, uh, the movement uh, chart for the submarine. I got a six, that's probably okay. It is range minus one. Actually, I kind of like that. So the submarine comes in one closer and that's what he does. Now he's gonna roll for contacts. I'm gonna get one attempt because we still don't know what he is. So I remember to go ahead and remove the seven marker for the Asakari that is no longer in that slot. And I put in the three markers for going into the two slot because he moved up. Uh, I pulled a chit and I got number five, which is the Fletcher, the best ship in the entire task force. Lucky us. So at this point, he's going to go ahead and do his detection attempt. So the submarine is trying to detect the Fletcher. The Fletcher has a noise modifier of one, so that is in his favor. In addition, he's gonna have to, since he's deep, uh, he's gonna have to come up through the layer, which is a minus two, and at range three, instead of range four, the, uh, the C state says he gets no help. So it's gonna be minus two with a minus, additional minus one for the noise modifier for the Fletcher. We've got a minus three overall. The base detection, as stated on the submarine's chit, is a six slash nine, and it's minus three. Three is rolled, it goes to a zero. He does not find the, uh, the Fletcher. Thank goodness for that. And the submarine is done. Now it's time to get serious on this guy. Let's go ahead and activate the helicopter. He's one movement away. He's got four basically activation points, whatever you want to call them. He's going to go one. He does not get a madman detection. The magnetic anomaly detector is not effective against deep submarines, but the helicopter can lower his dipping sonar to detect a uh, submarine that's deep. It takes two uh, activation points, so he's now used three, but he can do it. The base is four slash seven slash nine, four, seven, nine, and he's got a minus one capability. The sub has got a two noise modifier. So it's going to be a net minus one in the submarine's favor. Three, he does not detect the submarine. This guy, he's slippery. All right, I'm getting tired of this. How about you? Let's go ahead and activate the Fletcher. And the Fletcher has got a plus one skill against subs, so he gets that. Submarine still has his... Uh, two modifier for the for noise, so that's going to be one in the sub's favor. And on the sonar performance, Totoray, which the Fletcher has, is zero. And so we don't use the up here. We only use the Totoray and we don't use the layer. So there's no modifier for the sensor performance. It's going to be a net plus one on the roll, but the base of the Fletcher is a four slash six. So it's going to be minus one on the roll, trying to fit into a four slash six. Seven. All right. Seven goes to a six. Six is a level two detection, which will allow a single shot from the Fletcher going at the submarine. And we'll also find out what this submarine actually is. And taking a look at the reverse of the submarine counter, uh, one through four, it's a neutral and five through 10, it's an enemy, which would be Soviet. All right, let's take a look. One through four is neutral. That would be kind of good. Seven. Nope, we got a bad guy. All right, so I'm going to go 
pick a card from the Soviet uh, sub cards, and it's got to be a starred card. Okay, this is a starred card. I have got a Victor Three. Victor Three. Nasty boy. He can track two contents, contacts. Movement plus two. Holy smokes. He's quiet. Uh, the noise modifier is three, so good thing we found him now. And torpedo defense is two. This is possibly the best sub in the game as far as attack subs. So since the Fletcher got a detection two on this guy, he gets to fire a single weapon. He fires an ASROC rocket uh, launch torpedo, a Mark 46 torpedo. The base to hit is seven. The skill modifier for the Fletcher counts, so that's going to be plus one in his favor. The range is change. For shooting, for attacking, the range modifiers are actually printed on the map. So once he gets to range two, it's going to be plus one. Range one is plus two, and likewise there's detriments when you're out at five and six. The ship's torpedo defense is two. It's a good sub, so the net is plus one in the sub's favor now. But the detection level is also counted, and it's at detect two, so it's now back to a one in the, uh, in the Fletcher's favor. And that's what we got, one in the Fletcher's favor. Base roll is seven, so it's a seven. Add one to the roll. Ten. All right, so we got one hit. One hit on this victor. It takes two to take him out. So he gets a damage counter applied to him. And as we've seen before, the damage counter is going to be applied to this victor submarine. And now I think would be the perfect time to uncork the Asagiri, the guy that was uh, had the engine trouble earlier, but he's back in action now. And uh, he does not have a vertically launched Azrox, but the, he still can fire off two of them. There's two in each one of these little stacks here on the on this uh, counter tray. So he's going to fire off two of his Azrox. The Asagari is going to go ahead and launch two Mark 46 uh, with its Azrock launch torpedoes. It has a range of three, which is perfect. The modifiers are going to be a skill modifier for the uh, Asagari is zero. The range is zero. For attacking, the ranges are printed on the map. So range two is plus one, range one is plus two, and it gets bad at range five and six. The uh, sensor performance card, again, is only for detection, not for shooting. The submarine has a, a noise modifier of two, but he's damaged, so that reduces it to a one. So it's one in his favor. The detection level is two, so it goes back to a one in the shooter's favor. And we have volley fire, so it's going to be one in the shooter's favor for the first torpedo and two in for the second, the base number is seven. So we're shooting for a six and then a five. All right, shooting for six. Nope. Shooting for a five. Yes, got the second. Got a second hit on this guy. So the Asagari finishes off this submarine. And I go in ahead and put the marker right on the Asagari to remind myself that he has sunk a starred vessel, which will get him an extra experience point at the end of the engagement, which we are going to go ahead and work through right now. Oh, and once again, I forgot about this. So the shots were actually a whole lot better. I would have remembered, but we didn't need it. So, so much the better. So to conclude this mission, we draw another event card and our bad luck continues. We add one stress to all ships participating in the mission. Note, since the helicopter is not a ship, that won't include him, but when he lands, he collects another stress anyway. So everybody, uh, except for the commander, is going to get an additional stress. Uh, now we evaluate the encounter, and yes, it was a victory since we needed to destroy at least two subs. Well, we did that. We collect three SO points for our future expenditures. And the three extra points are noted on the campaign log. So after we uh, evaluate and award the goodies for uh, winning this encounter, we move on to the next phase. And on the map here, it says move enemy units, and that is a misprint. If you look at the other sequence of play uh, uh, aids that you get, this has to do with repairing ships that have temporary damage. One of the things that bothers me is that they didn't even get the sequence of play right when they printed it on the map. You'd think that's something they would spend a lot of time proofing to make sure they got it right. But here it is. 
Uh, so this is not move enemy ships. There are no enemy ships at this point. It is a damage repair phase, and there is no damage, so there's nothing to do. Add stress to ships and commanders. Okay, that we got to do. Now we're up to adjusting the stress levels of the various ships and the commander in the task force. The general rule is that ships in the screen add two stress, ships in the main part of the force add one, and ships in the supported slash protected zone subtract one. In addition, commanders that are on a ship in the screening force add two stress, and they add one if they are in the main body force. Uh, we have already taken care of the helicopter once it landed at the end of the engagement. He added a second stress, so he's now got stress two, and it does not take any additional stress at this time. In addition, uh, you can account for the cool factor for each individual unit. The basic rule is that in a random scenario, the only thing you get experience for is for sinking starred vessels, and uh, both the... Uh, Yubari and the Asagari, they each have one. They will each get credit for one kill. They will each get one extra experience point. And that's it. Except we also have a very special commander. Uh, Bouchard is a leader. That's his special skill. And since Bouchard is a uh, skilled leader, I remember I, I gave him the highest... Uh, Rating. He's the only skilled guy I got out here. I could only have one, and I decided to put, give, make it him instead of one of the ships. Oh, I also see he has a cool one. All right, so he doesn't have any stress either. All right, so no, no stress on Bouchard. He has a cool one. Uh, let's see, but he also can go ahead and add one experience per encounter so to distribute to whatever ship he wants to. So we're going to have, uh, oh, heck, why would I not give it to the Fletcher? So we're going to give uh, one experience point to the Fletcher. There are no promotions. Uh, no one's accumulated enough experience to have that happen yet. So we will return to the mission execution phase, where the next thing to do will be task force movement. But at this point, I think we've been at this long enough. I think we probably got a good hour in. So I'm going to go ahead and suspend this for now, call it a part one. And I will resume this with part two and taking us to the conclusion of this mission very shortly. If you've enjoyed this presentation, I'd appreciate it. You would hit the subscribe button. If you would hit the notification bell and go ahead and send a comment. Uh, if you've already subscribed, I thank you very much for your support and hope to continue having that in the future. But for right now, I think we all need a rest. So we will call it a day and I wish you all a pleasant evening. Bye for now.